Let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 is where we'll be tonight. Second Thessalonians chapter number 1 and we will be uh, continuing in what we began last week to study here uh, concerning one of these prayers of Paul had the privilege this past week on a, I think it was this past Friday night to drive up and preach in a men's prayer meeting in Saluda North Carolina and uh, was able to preach to a number of there's probably six or seven men there interestingly uh, this is the church that we donated our pews to. Not sure how many of you have not have come here since then, but uh, we used to have pews, right? All the people who've been here for a while, don't y'all remember the pews? Uh, the, the red pews we used to have in here. And um, we increased our seating capacity by going to chairs, and so we donated those pews to just a church that said they needed them. And uh, I got to preach to those pews this past Friday night. It was amazing. Amen? <laughs> and... Uh, you say, well, it's, it's weird for you to be sentimental about church furniture. There's whole chapters in the Bible about church furniture, all right? Y'all leave me alone, amen? I enjoyed it, and uh, it was good to uh, sit there and preach to those pews that God had done so much for me sitting on those pews, and then uh, years later, I got to go and preach to those pews, and so it was a blessing. It was actually the church where the movie Sheffy was filmed, uh, where... Um, where the, he, he's in there and he runs out, doesn't want to preach, and they drag him back in there and preaches. Have you seen that movie? Wonderful movie. I love it. My wife fell asleep. She didn't ever finish it, but I love the movie. And um, anyway, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, excuse me, verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, but I got to preach along the lines of these prayers of Paul. God has really helped me a lot in these prayers of Paul, and I hope he's helped you. As we've studied them together, uh, and me as a young man and a young pastor, I want to make sure that I'm praying the way God wants me to pray. And you should want God to approve of your praying. Amen? You want God to approve of your praying. And you say, well, how do I ensure that God will approve of my praying? You pray about what's on God's heart. That's, that's how we know what, what to pray for. Romans 8 says... That we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I believe in praying according to the will of God, praying in the Spirit. And when we do that, the Bible says anything that you pray according to His will, He hears it. And He's going to answer. Amen. And so one of the wonderful ways that we can pray according to God's heart is to look at God's heart on paper, which is the Word of God. This is God's heart. This is what He wants us to know. This is what He has given to instruct us as to how to live this Christian life. And you're not going to live this Christian life apart from having a prayer life because your prayer life is your Christian life. It is your relationship with God. It is your walk with God. So if you have no prayer life, you have no real substantive walk with God. Uh, and so, so God has really helped me a lot in studying this and studying along these lines. And we're going to look tonight at this prayer, what I've titled a prayer for approbation. Just a, It's a prayer for approval. That's what approbation means. It's approval. It's, it's having God's sanction. God, I want God's stamp of approval on my life. I need that. I need God to, to see what I'm doing, to see my daily walk with Him, and uh, my ministry, and my conversation, and my home life, and every area of my life. I want God's approval on it. If you've got God's approval, you don't need anybody else's exactly. approval. Amen? There'll be all kind of people who will disapprove of the things that you do and the positions that you hold and the life that you live. But so long as we have His approval, no other approval matters. Amen? No other approval matters. So that is what the Apostle Paul is praying for uh, in these verses. And we looked last week at the first phrase of verse number 11. Verse number 11 where it says, Wherefore also we pray always for you. That's about as far as we got last week. Uh, and the skeptic would say, well, you know what? You didn't get very far. You don't know how big of a phrase that is. That's a big phrase. Wherefore, also, we pray for you this concept of intercessory prayer, uh, where Paul is talking to God on the behalf of somebody else. That speaks to me of, of one that loves other believers. 
and that's willing to pray for them and to care about them and to bear their burdens to the throne of grace. And that's what we need in our day. Yes. We need intercessors. Yes. We need people who are willing to go to God on the behalf not just of yourself, but for somebody else. Not to pray selfishly, not to live selfishly. The way that you pray is the way that you live your Christian life. And so if our prayers only consist of ourself, guess what your thoughts only consist of? Yourself. If your words and your actions and all these things only point back to yourself, then you're not living the Christian life that God has called for you to live. So this concept of intercessory prayer is, is extremely important and relevant to our life. And we looked, we, the reason we spent the whole week is because of the first word of chapter number, uh, or verse number 11, which is the word, wherefore. Wherefore also we pray. And so last week we looked at this, this, the purpose of this prayer. It's a purposed prayer. What motivated Paul to pray for these saints? And we find that in the previous verses. So we noticed in verse number 3 through verse number 5 that this was a church that was in distress. Look back in verse number 3. He says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward one, each other abounded, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which also ye suffer. So he's saying this is a suffering church that is enduring tribulation and persecution because of their faith in Christ, and that motivates Paul to pray for them. Paul sees the distress that this church is in and feels uh, put motivated in his heart and feels a tug to pray for those who are in need and we should feel the same way. Amen. Amen? We should feel the same way. When you see somebody in need and somebody who is hurting or who is lacking in some kind of a way and you can pray for them, you should do that. Yeah. Amen? You should do that. We all would say that that would be a good thing to do. Can we get consensus on that? It'd be a good thing to do to pray for people who are in need. That's a wonderful thing. The Bible says that if you know something is good and you do it not, that's a sin. Amen? I just tricked all of you. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so if we know there is a benefit of praying for those who are in distress and we fail to do so, well, you know where that leaves you, right? You know where that leads you. So we, we saw that he was motivated to pray by this church's distress, also by their, uh, their, their enemy's destruction. Look in verse number 6. Verse number 6 says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Verse number 8, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his Power. He's saying, I am motivated to pray for you because the enemies that are persecuting you are going to come to an end. They're going to be destroyed. So what he's saying is, your problem is going to end. Y'all say amen? Their problem are, are those that are persecuting them. And he is writing and telling them, all of those that are persecuting you, God is going to come back and punish them one of these days. So what he's saying is, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Amen? The, 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 the tribulation's not going to be forever. The, the temptation and all these things that you're suffering, they're, they're temporal things. Isn't it easy to get in the middle of these trials and tribulations of life and forget that they're temporal? We lose sight of the eternal because we fixate our minds and our hearts on what is temporal. That which is going to pass. And Paul is praying for them with an understanding that all of their enemies are going to be vanquished in Christ, will be Lord of all. And he's going to come back, and he is going to, as verse number 8 says, in flaming fire, take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's motivated to pray because these saints are suffering, because their, uh, their enemy's destruction is near, meaning that it's not going to last forever, and then also because of their deliverance that is on the way. Look at verse number 7. Verse number 7, it says, "...unto you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels." Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, it says, "...when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day." He's referring to the day that he would preached the gospel to them, and this is what he's saying. "...everyone that believed that gospel message that I preached to you 
One of these days, you're going to be delivered. He's saying if you are saved by the grace of God, God is going to return. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy the armies of the Antichrist. He's going to rescue those who are suffering. And you and I aren't going to be troubled very long. Somebody say amen right there. Uh, tr- uh, we'll soon be done with troubles and trials. We'll soon be able to go to that better land and not have to suffer any more. So he is praying and he's motivated to pray because of their eventual deliverance. One of these days, these saints he's writing to are going to be delivered from their current situation, and that motivates him to pray for them. And then we look, so we notice the purpose of his prayer, and lastly, secondly, we notice the fact that this was a perpetual prayer. Verse number 11, look at verse number 11 again, where he says, Wherefore also we pray, and then he uses this word, always for you. He's saying, my prayer life could be defined as always. I asked the question last week, I'll do it again, and we'll move on. Define your prayer life. Fill in the blank. Could, could, it, be, could, it, be, could it be called always? God help us. Let's we'll just have an invitation. We'll just do that. We can just, we can just get, to the, get to the point, right? So, so, so he's saying my prayer life can be categorized as always, and I, I feel like most of us would have to say, okay, I, I don't know that I could say my prayer life is always. But he says, I always pray for you. What he's saying is, I always pray, and when I pray, I pray for you. God help us to be those who pray for others. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 59 that God is is, is speaking to the nation of Israel, and it says that 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 he wondered that there was no intercessor. That's what God said in Isaiah 59. He said, I I wonder... That there is no intercessor. Could be God's looking at Resurrection Baptist Church tonight. A church who understands the importance of prayer. A church that knows the importance of, of intercessory prayer. Of praying for other people. And God was looking at this nation of Judah in rebellion against God. And he wonders. Where are the intercessors? Where, where are those who are willing to pray for other people? God helps some intercessors to be found at Resurrection Baptist Church. Amen? God helps some, re- some, some intercessors to be found in our midst tonight. So we notice that this, the purpose, this was a purpose prayer. It was a perpetual prayer. I want to look thirdly. This was a petitioning prayer. He's praying with some petitions. There are some things that Paul is praying for for this church. And, and, and once we look at this, some of the things we've noted... Uh, about the motivations of his prayer are probably going to make a little bit more sense. All right, let's look at verse number 11. Verse 11 where it says, Wherefore also we pray always for you. This is what he prays. He prays that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are his petitions. These are, there are things, three things that he specifically wants to see God do in the life of these believers. And aren't you glad we have a God we can bring our petitions to? Brother Sam took some time tonight to pray down that prayer list, and I thank God that he did because we have a God who hears petitions and he answers prayer, and when we'll put faith in him, it'll be manifest in the answer to those prayers. So we have a God who can be trusted with our petitions. We can ask him, and he will hear us, and he will answer. So these are his prayers. He has three things he's praying for. He's praying, first of all, that these saints would be counted worthy. They would be counted worthy. It says right there that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Now this is a, a difficult phrase to unpack. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, of nuance, a lot of disagreement along, these, along this verse, concerning this verse. And the disagreement is about whether or not this verse is a positional verse or it is a practical verse. Meaning that, that I'm praying that God would count you worthy. Is he saying that, that, for, that somehow we could be deserving of heaven? Because in and of ourselves, we cannot be deserving of heaven. Amen? So, so, so the word worthy jumps off the page and people don't know what to do with it. 
What do you mean that we could be counted worthy of this calling? So what I want to do is move, I just want to, I want to define a few terms in this phrase, and I think it will make us and help us to understand what he's saying. So he says that he's praying that our God would count. That word count, it just means to, to consider, to esteem, or to appraise. So, so he's, he's praying concerning the way God considers them, the way that God views them. Count you worthy. That word worthy, it does mean deserving, but it also means suitable. Amen? If something is worthy, that means it's fitting, it's, it's proper. It's, it's a suitable thing. So he's praying that God would consider you to be suitable or deserving. And then he says, of this calling. That our calling is just, it's a summons, it's an invitation. But I believe that the calling is defined back in verse number 5. We find out what this calling, or what it is that, that God has called us to. Look back in verse number 5. If you will, verse number 5, it says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, watch this, that ye may be counted worthy, so he's, he's talking about the same thing, within the same context, he talks about being counted uh, worthy of his calling in verse number 11. And now back in verse number 5, he's, praying that he, or he's, he's saying that they would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. I believe that's what the calling is. This calling is in reference to the kingdom of God. So he's praying that they would be considered to be, to be suitable or to be fitting or deserving of the kingdom of God. And now, now a lot, again, there's more discrepancy there. And people think that, well, that kingdom of God must always be a reference to heaven. But that, that's not what the Bible teaches. A kingdom simply defined is that over which God reigns. Amen? That's what a kingdom is. It is the area, if, say you have a king and he sits on a throne, his kingdom extends as far as his domain. Everything that, that he is in control over or the king of is within the kingdom that he is the king of. So, so when this Bible talks about the kingdom of God, it is not always referring to heaven. It can be referring to a couple of other things. Now one of these days there will be a physical kingdom that God is going to set up. Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem on the throne of David. And that over which he reigns will be the kingdom of God. We're all looking forward to that. Amen. But you and I who are saved are a part of the kingdom of God today because he's my king. Amen. Is he your king? Is he your king tonight? If he's your king tonight, then you are a part of his kingdom. So there is a spiritual aspect to this kingdom of God. All of those who confess him king are under his lordship, under uh, his reign, and therefore we are a part of this kingdom. So this kingdom of God is, is in a sense referring to salvation. If you are saved, you are a part of the kingdom of God. What do people say is that we're out here, we're trying to build the kingdom. Right? What they mean by that is we're trying to win sinners to Christ. That way there are more people who are under the kingdom of God, who are, who are a part of the kingdom of God and involved in it. So that's what we're supposed to be doing is building the kingdom, bringing people under the rulership and subjection of Christ. So, so, so that's what he's talking about in these verses. He's praying that, that God would consider them to be suitable as those who were saved. What he's saying is, if you're a part of the kingdom, you should look like it. Amen? What he's saying is, if you're a part of the kingdom, you should act like it. God, count them worthy of this calling, meaning that, that, that they're called something. Now, now help them to, to, to look like it and act like what they're called. You know, a whole lot of people wear the moniker and the badge, Christian. Do they not? There, there, are, there are multitudes and factions, all these different groups and religious denominations and, and, and hordes of, of thousands and millions of people who would raise their hand and say, I am a Christian. There are far less who walk worthy of the calling. Amen? That, 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 that phrase, the, to, to, to walk, it, it refers to the way that you live. The way that you conduct yourself. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at a few more verses that might would shed some light on, on 
uh, Paul's usage of this phrase, to be counted worthy. Again, I'm not worthy of myself, right? We're not talking about earning heaven. We're not talking about a works-based salvation. We're talking about somebody living as if what, a, what is true of them is true. Meaning, if they're saved by the grace of God, they should live as if they're saved by the grace of God. Be counted worthy of the calling, of the title. Ephesians chapter 4, four and verse number 1. Paul, again, same author, says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. He is praying that they will walk, or y'all know scripturally that word walk, it refers to your manner of life, your lifestyle, the way that you live. And he's, he's praying, he's saying that they would, hoping that they would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they're called. Meaning they have a vocation, they have a title, they, 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 have, they have a name that's supposed to define them, but for so many of us, the name that's supposed to define us does not. The name Christian, you know what that word means? It means little Christ. They were first called Christians in Antioch, and it wasn't a positive term. It was a, it was a derogatory term. It was an insult to be called a Christian. What they were saying was that, 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 that crowd over there, they remind us of that, of that Christ. And Christians are still supposed to remind people of Christ today. Amen? You and I who are saved, we're supposed to remind people of Christ. That is walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. We're called Christians. We should act like it. We should live like it. Wouldn't the world be a better place? Amen? If everybody who said that they were a Christian, and I don't think most people don't understand all that entails being a Christian. It's supposed to be that if you're a Christian, that means you're in Christ. That means that you're saved. That means that the Holy Spirit resides inside of your heart. That's what being a Christian is supposed to mean. But it has become a, a, a cheaper word, if you will. It's become, it, it, we, we've, we've degraded in value the term Christian. And we've done that because we've not walked worthy. We should walk worthy of that vocation, of that calling, of that position in the kingdom of God. We should live as if we are really under His authority. And that's what it means to be a part of a kingdom. It means that you are under authority. God help us. Amen? It got real quiet in here. That's okay. You can turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. A few more verses concerning this. We find that phrase mentioned again. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 10. You might want to ask the question, walk worthy. Well, how do I do that? How do I be counted worthy? Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 10, it says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Again, you can't be deserving of Jesus' blood. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something being suitable or something being fitting. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. How do we do that? Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the two ways that you can walk worthy, that you increase, that you be fruitful in every good work, meaning you're supposed to do good works, you're supposed to live the Christian life and allow people to see that by your works, and when they see your works, they see your fruit, they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven, right? He uses that phrase being fruitful, meaning, meaning there's supposed to be an, an outward, visible representation of the fact that you're saved. So, so, we, so we do this, we walk worthy by our living, but we walk worthy by our learning. He says that they, uh, that they, in increasing in the knowledge of God. That's how you walk worthy. You increase in the knowledge of God. The more you learn of the Bible, the more that you learn about Jesus Christ, you are, you are becoming more and more worthy. You're walking more and more worthy. God help us to do that. Amen. That, that's what he's, this is what Paul is praying for this church. That their, that their good works will increase, 
that their knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Scriptures would increase. And by doing that, then God can count them worthy of this calling. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse number 12, it says again that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into His kingdom and glory. That's what we're talking about. Another verse that I love that came to my heart while Brother uh, Elijah was, was presenting just a little while ago, Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in mine absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You work out your salvation. What he's not saying is, he's not patting them on the back saying, all right, good luck making it to heaven. <laughs> work out your own salvation. Just do the best you can. That, that's not what he's talking about. When he says to work out your own salvation, what he's saying is to work out what God has already worked in. Right. He has worked in salvation. He has given us the Holy Spirit of God, and he, and Jesus, and he resides inside of us. Now we should work out. It shouldn't stay inside of you. It should get on the outside of you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he's praying that they would be counted worthy. He's, secondly, he prays about God's completed will. Let's look at the next phrase there. The next phrase. He says that he would count you worthy of this calling. That's his first prayer request. And then he says, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. So his prayer is that God would complete, and that what I believe what he means by his good pleasure is talking about the will of God. What, what's God's good pleasure for your life? God has a good pleasure for my life. He's got a good pleasure for your life. That means he has a will that, 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 that he has specific to your life. God has a job for you to do. Amen? Or not? Everybody okay? Everybody okay? It, God has a job for you to do. He has, he has a good pleasure that, that He wants to be accomplished in your life by you. Obviously, I can't accomplish it for you, right? It's, it's your life. It's, it's what God has for you. And there's, what, there's something that God has for you that I cannot do. God hadn't called me to go to Cordova, right? He has this brother over here. God's called him to do that. That's the good pleasure of His will for this family. It's to go over there and to obey God and to preach the gospel to just a few, a handful of folks, whoever God will send his way, he's going to preach the gospel. That's God's good pleasure for him. God has a good pleasure for you too. Amen? And this is why one of the reasons why I love uh, when missionaries come in and they present their work, and you and I who are small-town cowpens, right, we get to, to sit here and we get to meet a brother who's going to be going uh, you know, a, a long distance away to preach the gospel, and you and I get to meet this man and get to be associated with him, and our children get to see somebody surrender their lives and sell all and forsake everything to follow Christ. They get to see that. But listen, they shouldn't have to find a missionary to see that. We should show them that. That's right. They need to see that in me. My kids need to see me do that. They need to see me be willing to forsake all and follow Christ, and that might not mean that you move across the world, but it means that you are under His complete and total obedience, His complete and total rule. Whatever God says for you to do, you do it. His prayer is that this church will complete the will of God for their life. That's what He's praying. I've heard surrender defined as this, or a little picture, a word picture for surrender. I thought it was a blessing. Surrender is when you take a blank sheet of paper and you sign your name and then you give it to God and say, you fill out the rest. I'm going to go ahead and up front sign up for whatever it is that you want me to do before I ever know what it is. Isn't that what our brother said? He said that God had burned his heart for missions, and before he knew where or what or when or how, he said, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Amen. He, he, that, that is surrender. We call it surrender. I prefer the word submission, personally. I know I still use the word surrender, and I will probably forever. So Surrender, is, it gives you the connotation that you're waving the white flag as if you've resisted. You don't have to resist the will of God. We've completely lost it in our mentality. I think a lot of it is because we have, and, it's, and I don't think anybody means anything wrong about it, but when people get up in the pulpit and they'll say, well, I didn't want to do that. God wanted me to do it. And I, what do they say? Most people say, I ran from the call to preach. You ever heard that? Most preachers. Not to say they didn't. They probably did. But we shouldn't run from it. 
it shouldn't be that I'm a preacher against all my own desires and wishes. No, we, we should sign up gladly for whatever God wants us to do. There doesn't have to be an opposition. We can say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do that. And do it gladly and do it the first time, not after God has to drag you through the mud and chastise you and convict you for, for ages to make you do what you're supposed to do. Not everybody has to be a Jonah, right? Who has to be swallowed by a whale and vomited up on dry land before he'll do what God told him to do the first time. Amen? Amen. What we can do is we can sign up for whatever God's will is and do it gladly and the first time with a smile. Amen. That's what I say at my house to my kids. You're going to do what I say the first time I say it, and you're going to do it with a smile. Amen. All the parents, I figured y'all say amen there. That was, that was pretty good. That, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want to instill in them. That's the relationship that a child should have with their parent, and that's the relationship that you and I should have with our father. God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it the first time and with a smile. Amen. That, that is submission. That is willingly submitting your will to whatever God wants you to do. That's what he's praying for. He's praying that they will complete the will of God for their life. And then thirdly, he prays, for, he prays about his conquering work. Let's look at the last part of verse number 11. He says, And the work of faith with power. So those are his three requests, that God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the goodness excuse me, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. His goodness is that which has written his good pleasure. Amen. It, you, God's plan for you was, was directed by and was planned by and written by his goodness. What, what did it say whenever, whenever Jesus is about to be born? What did the angels say? Peace on earth and what? Good will toward men. Good will. God's got a good will. Amen. So, so the, the, the good pleasure of his will is directed by his goodness. God is not trying to sell you short. He's got the best in mind for you. If you'll resign your plans for your life and submit to his plans for your life, you're going to end up in a whole lot better place. Amen? I figured it would be more than just two people who thought that was a good thought. I thought everybody would think that was a good thought. His plan for you is better than your plan for you, and let's submit to his will and stop fighting against it and trying to do our own will. So it's a completed will, but he also talks about uh, his conquering work. The last part of verse number 11. He says, and the work of faith with power. The work of faith with power. That's the third thing that Paul prays for this church at Thessalonica. Albert Barnes said it this way. I really like what he had to say. He said that this, this refers to the work which faith is adapted to produce on the soul. When he talks about the work of faith, he's saying the work that faith does to you. Faith, faith, faith ha does a work to you. And he is praying that this, that this work of faith will be continued and, and will continue to have the effect that faith has. Faith has a very special effect on us. Amen? Faith is what saved you. So it had that effect. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. That's the work of faith. That's the first work of faith. When you place faith in Jesus Christ, the first work of faith is, I'm going to forgive you of all your sin. You're going to get to go to heaven. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. That's the first work of faith. But that's not the last time we exercise faith. That's not the last time that faith should do a work in our life. So what's the greatest work of faith? The Bible says this in 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 4. It says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It said, Our faith is that which overcomes the world. You know how you can overcome the world on a day-to-day -day basis? By faith. It's by faith. That is the work of faith in your life is that, is that as that faith continues and you progress in your Christian walk, you'll overcome the world more and more and more. The longer you've been saved, the longer faith has been working on you, the more, of, of the more like Jesus that we should look. Amen? That's the work of faith. He, he's praying that this work of faith will continue with power in the lives of those he is writing to. Let's move on to verse number 12. I'll be done. I'm not going to spend forever here, all right? Verse number 12. First word of verse number 12 is the word that. So he is, he is about to tell us why. 
Why is it important? And listen, all these, all these things, that, all these three prayer requests, all have to do with God's approval. Amen? I want, I want the, the, them to be counted worthy. That means I want God, God I want, we, need, we want your approval in their life. And, and, and we, God, we want them to complete your will for their life. God, we want you to be pleased with their completion of your will. God, we want their faith to continue and for them to continue to overcome the world more and more. And we want God to be approved, uh, God to approve of that. But here's the reason why we need God's approval. Verse number 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified Amen. in you. The... I believe it was Brother Paris Reedhead, I might be wrong, but I believe it was, might have been Paris Reedhead, who said that the chief end of man is the glory of God. That's the chief end. That's, that, that's, what, that's what we're all here for. Amen? You want to have purpose in your life? You, you want to have some, some, some reason to live, some reason to get up in the morning? You should get up in the morning because of the glory of God, for the glory of God. That's why we should do everything that we do. And what he's saying is that if we'll obey Christ in these areas and allow God to work in our heart and allow for us to, to walk worthy of this vocation, God will get glory because of that. God will get glory because when we obey Him. He's praying that God will be able to approve of their lifestyle if they'll stop just saying that they're saved but live like they're saved. If they'll live it out, if they'll, if, they'll, if they'll be what God has called them to be and to walk worthy of this calling, then God will get glory by that. that this is what Paul's prayer will produce. It'll produce glory. And it'll also produce grace. Look at the last part of verse number 12. It says, According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to, you and I are going to do anything that can be approved of God, it's going to be by His grace. Amen? It's going to be by His grace. It's not going to be by your own will. It's not going to be by, by the strength of your efforts. It's not going to be by anything other than the grace of God. That's what we need. Amen? We need the grace of God. And if God will give us His grace, then He will be glorified by the result. That's what we need. Give ourselves fully to Christ. Allow Him to give us His grace. And when He does that, when you put those two things together, a submitted saint and a loving Savior who will give grace to His children, when that happens, He gets glory. And that should be all that we want. That should be all we want. We should be completely satisfied with His approval and with His glory, that's the only thing that matters.